let's talk a little bit about what defensive FX means because I mean if I was thinking about this a couple of years ago I would go to the Japanese yen to the US dollar but given how they've been trading recently I really don't know what to say what are you recommending yeah well we really think that Japanese yen is the safest currency to be in in this highly uncertain volatile uh, both macro and, and market uh, environment. Uh, the yen, you're right, works as a safe haven in a particular way. It works as a safe haven when U.S. demand is slowing down, when the U.S. economy uh, is going into the recession or, or growth is coming down. And that's what the Fed has been trying to achieve. That's what we're starting to see in the data. And tomorrow's payroll report will tell us whether we're seeing that in the labor market now with, with employment. I think that we will see substantial signs of slowing and that makes yen our, our top pick at the moment. Of course, where the dollar goes also very much because of where the euro is at right now. What are you expecting on that front? Both the Fed and the ECB are hiking rates. Inflation is too high in both economies. So the question is, you know, beyond that, are there things that could drive the euro up or, or down? And I think really there's tail risk in both directions for the euro. On the one hand, Exiting negative rates after eight years could be quite a big deal for fixed income capital flows back into the euro area now that your cash earns a positive yield. Uh, at the same time, we still have a geopolitical conflict in Eastern Europe that introduces tail risk to the growth outlook. So frankly, it's a really tough uh, spot. Our best guess is that the medium term outlook for the euro is still higher. We still think medium term appreciation, but a lot of tail risks in the current environment. We don't have a active long short recommendation in euro dollar uh, right now. Zach, obviously the direction of these dollar pairs really depends on where we go with treasury yields and where we go with further gains in oil. Do you have assumptions on those two factors? Well, of course, uh, it's a highly uncertain environment and tomorrow morning's uh, payroll report is going to have a lot to say on where rates are going uh, in particular. The Fed, as you've heard in recent commentary, is debating whether to keep hiking at a 50 basis point clip beyond the next two meetings or whether maybe to slow down. There's a, a debate playing out in public. We're going to get the key input in that decision tomorrow morning. We're below consensus. We're 100,000 below consensus for payrolls tomorrow. If we get that sort of thing, I think Treasury yields would probably pull back uh, over the near term and the yen would probably outperform uh, within G10FX. Of course, we had the balance sheet runoff begin this week. It's a milestone, whichever way you look at it. Um, can I ask you our MLive blog post question for this week? Where do you see as the biggest pain points for markets coming out of quantitative tightening, given that we know at least some of it must be priced in by now? I think the market that faces the uh, most medium-term challenges from uh, the process of tightening monetary policy is just the bond market. You know, we probably are moving into an environment where inflation is harder to bring down than where it was over the last, say, 20 years. In that type of environment, the general level of interest rates is going to be higher. Bond returns are going to have a hard time from raising rates from quantitative tightening. So I think you're still supposed to say the bond market over, say, the next one or two years uh, will face the biggest headwinds from the Fed's persistent uh, shrinking of its balance sheet. Take a look at this chart. Goldman Sachs saying that emerging market stocks, bonds and currencies stand to reap the rewards of a potential peak in the US dollar. Strategists there are also pointing to China and Southeast Asia as attractive targets. Still with us is Zach Pandel, who is a co-head of Global FX and EM Strategy at Goldman Sachs. And uh, Zach, it's not just, of course, the assumption of a peak in dollar, but also the assumption of a peak in US inflation as well. A lot of the data versus the forecast, though, have been quite jarring and unusual. So what's your takeaway in terms of some good opportunities here? Really, the key assumption that we're making in our forecast, I think a lot of forecasts are making, forecasters are making, is that the Chinese economy will recover in the third quarter of this year. You know, that from a macro standpoint, of course, there's a lot of things going on. But just in terms of adding up world GDP growth, the weakness in the Chinese economy related to COVID lockdowns, uh, has been the key factor holding back uh, world growth. We think that's going to be rebounding over the course of the next few months. If that proves the case, if the Fed is only moving up at roughly 50 basis points per year, then I do think emerging market currencies could stand to benefit. And I would say, in particular, currencies in Latin America, the undervalued, high-carry, commodity-exporting currencies, that's where we think we would see capital go uh, if the Chinese economy does, in fact, rebound substantially over the next few months. 
Does a rebound in the economy fueled by a significant amount of infrastructure investment and economic easing necessarily drive strength in the yuan, though? And, and to that extent, do we still see the yuan as being a major anchor for the rest of the EM basket? Uh, not necessarily. It may not necessarily drive yuan appreciation. You know, China is, is a different set of policy tools than, say, the United States or, or the euro area. So we don't tend to see policy easing uh, show up in the exchange rate quite uh, to the same extent. Uh, that being said, I don't think that uh, Chinese authorities want to see a very strong exchange rate. You know, the primary goal is to help the economy grow. Uh, exchange rate appreciation could hold that back on the margin. We think that they're going to focus on other tools, things like infrastructure investment. This should help domestic markets. You know, the currency probably range bound uh, for now in the context of a fairly firm dollar. Uh, and if we do see the dollar turn lower, we would probably want to concentrate our bets in things like the Latin American currencies rather than the yuan itself. And Zach, we have seen also this year equity performance really vary from what we've seen in the past, whether it's growth versus value, whether it's, you know, this concentration on tech. Um, does that have implications for FX, especially when we're looking at, say, equities-centric Northeast Asian uh, currencies or more tech-centric markets? Absolutely. I do think that the sort of tech-centric rally in markets and equity markets over the last decade has been quite helpful for the dollar in particular, but maybe some of these other tech-centric markets, a Korea or Israel, uh, for example, uh, have benefited from a tech-led equity market. But those things are changing, and we're in a more uh, value-oriented equity market where things like financials, commodities, materials are outperforming. Uh, and that has currency implications because uh, those sector compositions differ across countries. Countries like Canada or Australia or even the UK benefit in this more value-led uh, equity environment. So uh, in a more sort of benign market environment where recession risks uh, calm down a little bit, I do think like markets like Canada would look attractive again.